It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we're delighted that you have chosen to join us. This, of course, is our family room, if you've just now started watching. And yes, it's full of plaid. (laughs) I'm (laughs) Scots-Irish. We call this Gilbert House Ministries because literally this is coming from our house, and we uh, welcome you to it as we discuss the... uh, the mysteries of the end times, which really is the culmination of what the gospel is all about. It really is. And we have a guest with us today, uh, an interview that re- you recorded a week or two ago. And it is mind blowing because if you have never studied the Septuagint, trust me, you're going to want a copy. And you can get a free copy online. Oh, yeah. This is uh, the translation of the Bible that was done by Jewish religious scholars about two centuries before the birth of Jesus, was completed about 200 years before mm-hmm. the birth of Jesus. This was done at the command of the Greek king of Egypt, one of the uh, generals of Alexander, who uh, divided up Alexander the Great's kingdom after his death in Babylon around, what was it, 332 B.C., somewhere around there? Somewhere in there. It's one of the Ptolemies, I think. Yes, so one of the Ptolemies. Wanting to understand better the uh, religion of the subject peoples, because he was in control of Palestine at the time, which uh, had a high percentage of Jews, and of course Alexandria was also a hub of Mm -hmm. uh, Jewish religious scholarship. So he tasked them with translating the Hebrew scriptures, what we Christians would call the Old Testament, into Greek. And the Septuagint, so-called because it's believed that there were 70 scholars who worked on this, uh, this would have been the scriptures, the Old Testament, that available to the apostles. Exactly. And so when you read the, fir- the, the New Testament, they are inspired by the Holy Spirit, but oftentimes their, their uh, uh, understanding of the world, of Hebrew history, mm-hmm. was from the Septuagint. Right. And as uh, our guest, Doug Woodward, points out that most of the citations, well, all of the citations of Old Testament scripture in our New Testament come from the Septuagint translation. Which is really sobering when you think about it, because most of us, even if you grew up in church and have read the Bible many times, it's very possible you have never read the Septuagint. And you may have even heard the term and thought, don't really know what that is. But the fact is, it was based on a manuscript we no longer have. Right. And after that, the manuscript that we know and all our translations are from, it was changed. It was changed in a number of ways. Now, it doesn't affect our theology as Christians because the doctrine of salvation that we know was preserved. Is, was preserved but it's, of course, the New Testament was not uh, touched because the Masoretic text uh, only exactly. dealt with the Hebrew scriptures. But, but, but it's in the Old Testament. Correct. The idea of salvation. It's over and over and over right, again. Right, right. And so this has some interesting implications for our understanding of, uh, of end times prophecy mm-hmm. because the prophecies of the Old Testament cited by John the Revelator mm-hmm. um, come from the books of Daniel and Isaiah and Zechariah and he would have had access to those, if not the older Hebrew texts, then the Greek Septuagint translation. Uh, Now, the changes are subtle, but very important, and Doug will talk about that uh, after the break as we get into the first part of the interview with Doug. But uh, again, I think the one thing that we need to stress up front is that this does not mean that we cannot trust our Bibles. The fact that our Old Testament comes from the Masoretic text, Mm -hmm. and this Masoretic text was completed about the year uh, 1000 AD, so about 1200 years later than the Septuagint translation. But again, Christian doctrine, as described as laid out in the New Testament, not affected by the Masoretics, or right. the Masoretes at all. Right. And, and 
to their credit, the Masoretes, even though they tried to de-emphasize certain aspects of the supernatural realm to delegitimize the claims of Christians that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, that he mm-hmm. was literally the Son of God, um, they didn't go so far as to change things that are re- really would have required wholesale surgery. For example, Psalm 22, mm-hmm. um, Isaiah chapter 53, yes, which, which, which they the rabbis today. to this day ignore. Right, um, A friend of ours, uh, Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat, who joins us on our Israel tour next March, he, he witnessed in Israel by printing out what looked to be, at first glance, a menu from a Chinese restaurant, because apparently Israelis love, love Chinese, Chinese food. restaurants. Yeah, yes. and uh, you know, so do we. But it was actually the text of Psalm, or rather Isaiah chapter 53. So they were going around handing this out, the, hey, brand new Chinese restaurant in town, you need to go. And so people were taking it, and they were reading it, and realizing, wait a minute. Yes, yes. And of course, you read in Psalm, uh, Isaiah 53, who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Isn't that amazing? The rabbis today, ignore they avoid this because it raises uncomfortable questions. Who is this that's being referred to here? Yes, because they really have never been exposed to this chapter in Isaiah, but also they don't understand the name Yeshua. Yes. They think that when we talk about Jesus, we're talking about someone they've been uh, told is named Yeshu, and that's a pejorative. It's an insult in Hebrew. So uh, you see over and over again in the the Old Testament, the word that's translated salvation Mm -hmm. is Yeshua. Yeah, and it's really remarkable. So while the Masoretes, the uh, Jewish religious scholars in the centuries after the resurrection of Jesus did change the text on which our English Old Testament is based today, they did not change it so much that we cannot recognize the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit yes. preserved it, but also because of the Septuagint. Yes. Because an Egyptian ruler wanted to understand Judaism, mm-hmm. we have the Septuagint. That's why I think it's so important if you want to dig into the scriptures, if you especially want to dig into the Old Testament, then we strongly recommend it. And Doug Woodward is the expert. He is. He's written a two-volume set called Rebooting the Bible, and uh, we'll talk with Doug about why the Septuagint is so important when Unraveling Revelation continues. Space is not the final frontier, but there are those who want you to think it is. 75 years ago, something crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. An industry has grown up to sell the idea that the pilots were extraterrestrials. We want you to know the truth. For a limited time, we're making available a special offer featuring the groundbreaking book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. This book shows step-by-step how the occult teachings of Madame Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley grew into the ancient aliens hypothesis of the modern UFO movement. It's our Gilbert House Roswell special. For just $35, we'll send you The Day the Earth Stands Still, plus our DVD sets, The Best of Sci Friday, Volumes 1 and 2. It's a $65 value for just $35. Take advantage of the Gilbert House Roswell Special for a limited time only, and you'll only find it at our store, online at gilberthouse.org. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we're delighted to have as a guest today Doug Woodward, good friend of ours, and he has put in the hard work to come up with this amazing two-volume set, Rebooting the Bible. So here's part one of a three-part series with Doug. The Septuagint is something many of us have heard of, but we don't know a whole lot about it, and... uh Obviously, if you don't know much about it, we don't know why we should pay attention to it. Joining us on the program this week is a gentleman who's a longtime friend of ours, and we are 
really pleased to be able to introduce him to you, our Unraveling Revelation audience. Uh, known him for quite some time. He's a professor of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship at a major university. He's got many qualifications here. He's uh, well, like Sharon and me, we've done a lot of things in life, and I think God has finally found the place uh, to use his uh, talents. He's got a master's in finance, but a master's in theology as well, and he's written more than 20 books over 10 years, including Will Babylon Re- Be Rebuilt in the Last Days, The Next Great War in the Middle East, a title that's looking sadly more relevant with each passing week, The Final Babylon with co-authors Doug Krieger and Dean McGriff, a biography of the Christian Bible, and the two-volume set that will be the uh, heart of the conversation over the next few weeks, Rebooting the Bible, Parts 1 and 2. You can find his website online at faith-happens.com. And uh, we welcome Doug Woodward to the program. Doug, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to join us. Hey, Derek, it's so great once again to be with you. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to our discussion this evening. This is uh, a subject that uh, you introduced to us as uh, we've... You, you've helped Sharon and me to understand why the Septuagint is a translation that we should at least consult and uh, compare with our English language translations. We like the ESV, but we look at the NET and the King James and uh, comparing various translations. The Septuagint, the English version of the Greek Bible or the Greek translation completed um, before Jesus was born is uh, very Long important before. as well. Yeah. Almost uh, well, three centuries before. For, for people not familiar with the Septuagint, what is it and why is it relevant? Yeah, okay. Very good. Well, to give you some background on the Septuagint, um, this was a uh, translation of what I consider to be the most authentic Hebrew version. Uh, this translation was completed by numerous scholars. There's some uh, legend, I believe, that as many as 70 were actually involved in this translation. And that might be, might be true, uh, but it might not be true. Uh, but nevertheless, there were experts that did the translation from uh, a version of Hebrew that was probably only about 120 to 130 years away from the compilation that Ezra did around 410, 420 B.C., all right, and so this was done, in other words, about 120 to 140 years later, and, uh, and so the, the opportunity for the Greek translation to really nail the original Hebrew, the most authentic Hebrew, uh, is, uh, is superb, and, uh, and why it's important from that standpoint is that the, the text that our Bibles, whether we're Protestant or Catholic, our Bibles were based upon a Hebrew version that was, I'll, I'll use the word remanufactured, uh, roughly 400 years after the Septuagint by uh, a group we know as the Pharisees who became the rabbis. And they did their, their translation that became the Masoretic text eventually. And again, uh, that was done about 120 AD or AD 120 roughly 400 years after the uh, the Greek Septuagint was translated. And what's important is that, as uh, my research and research from a number of others uh, has shown, is that the uh, Pharisees uh, that became rabbis and did this translation, they changed a lot of verses uh, in what was the, the Hebrew that they used, and, uh, and that has been passed down to us. And so uh, they changed passages primarily related to the first coming of the Messiah, and uh, they did their best to obfuscate the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was a perfect candidate to be the Messiah. And so uh, uh, anyway, so in the, in the books that I've written, I document extensively this whole story and also point out, oh, almost 30 verses that were changed. It's, uh, it's pretty much the messianic prophecies of the first coming, and it's the chronologies in Genesis 5 and 11 where the, the, the greatest number of changes uh, exist that are really relevant to us today. So the, uh, the Pharisees who prepared the text from which our English Bibles are translated mm, essentially they did. They, yeah, I'm de- sorry, de-emphasized the, the prophecies that yes. support the, uh, the identity of Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah. Yeah, there really are three topics 
that they tinkered with or tampered. Uh, one is the nature of the Messiah, the being of the Messiah, uh, essentially refuting anything in the in the ancient scriptures that suggested that the Messiah would be divine and that he would be the Son of God. Uh, the rabbis uh, did not believe that to be true. Uh, they also changed the mission of the Messiah. The mission uh, that is in the Septuagint for Jesus is that he came to bring the Gentiles into the family of God. And <laughs> the rabbis did not want that to be um, really pushed forward in their Bible. And uh, so th that was the, the, the second uh, major issue that they changed. Uh, let's see, the third issue, they changed the, his, uh, oh, the, uh, the method for salvation. The third uh, issue was, how are we saved? And there were a number of verses that, of course, uh, the New Testament quotes the Septuagint, and that may be a surprise to most people, that 80 to 90 percent of the verses in the New Testament that are quoting the Old Testament are not quoting the Masoretic text. They're quoting the Septuagint. And uh, so in that, we learn that uh, the nature of the salvation that Messiah would bring uh, was the power of his name. And you see in the changes that the, that the rabbis uh, changed, what the verses that they altered, the, uh, their emphasis was continuing to be the law. And it's, uh, it's, it, this is not subtle stuff. When you look at these verses and the way they were changed, you realize that this is a corruption of the original Hebrew that has carried forth for over well, almost 2,000 years, and has influenced the Bibles that we utilize today, as well as the Catholic Bible. So it's uh, it's rather astounding. This might be disturbing to people who've not heard this before and don't know what the Septuagint is. If they're just being exposed to this for the first time, Doug, how does this affect our ability to trust our Bibles? I mean, it almost sounds like, if we're not careful in the way we present this, that uh, we're mm -hmm arguing against the inerrancy of Scripture. Right, right. Now, certainly, uh, well, certainly I start off with Isaiah 55, 11, that God's word does not return to him void. Um, so his, his word, whatever it sets out to achieve, it will achieve it. Um, and I certainly still believe in the inerrancy of the autographs of the Scripture, where there's perhaps the, the single biggest variance is the King James Bible. There are many who support the King James Bible as the only inspired Bible. And the reason they believe that is because they believe that the English of 1611, the King's English, was the inspired Bible. In other words, it improved upon the Greek and the Hebrew uh, of the original Bible that dates back oh, into the second, third century in terms of a completed Bible, uh, what we call a codex or the codices. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's a factor. Now, uh, I believe that the Septuagint, if you read it side by side, and I know, Derek, that you and, and Sharon have done this, if you read it side by side, you discover a number of things that were perhaps uh, omitted in the Masoretic text or changed. And so if you're seeking to know the, the authentic uh, Old Testament, the Septuagint really is the key to doing that. And, uh, and so I believe that uh, although there, there have always been changes in, in editorial comments that became part of the text and so forth, and yet they do not change the message of the Bible in any way. The evangelical position, the standard one, is that the autographs are inerrant, but through the ages there have been changes that have crept into the text, and yet those changes do not invalidate the Word of God and do not compromise the Word of God. And so I still maintain that the Word of God is absolutely true, and it's pure, and it accomplishes its, uh, its intentions. And the Septuagint actually helps us get closer to the original work that uh, was done by Moses and Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah and all of the, the writers of the Old Testament. So the, uh, the apostles in the first century who wrote some about the end times, uh, Paul, Peter, 
Uh, John certainly uh, contributed to our understanding of what is going to come at the end. Um, right. The Septuagint, the Greek language Bible that was completed a couple of centuries before the birth of Jesus, this was the text that was available to them? Yes, it was. And this is the, the text that they used. You know, John has over, oh, I think it's over 300 quotations of the Old Testament prophets. And it was the Septuagint version that, for the most part, that, uh, that the disciples, all of the disciples, utilized. Now, Paul, because he was trained, uh, he was a scholar, and he was trained to understand the Hebrew and its uh, derivation, its original words, and so forth. The apostles were less educated. I don't think they were uneducated, but they were less educated. And so they relied heavily on the Septuagint and the Greek, and it's what... Um, that's what the early church spoke. Uh, for in fact, many don't know that the Septuagint was the Bible, really for the first four hundred to six hundred years of the church. It wasn't until almost the sixth or even seventh century before a Latin Bible, the the Vulgate, written or translated by Jerome, uh, before it really began to catch on. And so, and the Orthodox Church, the the Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, they still use the Septuagint. They've never changed. Yes, the apostles utilize the Septuagint, and when one actually does a comparison, this is one of the things that, that I would encourage folks to do, is uh, look at the New Testament. When you see it's quoting the Old Testament, look at the Old Testament in the King James and look at the Old Testament quotation in the New Testament. Many times you're going to see that they're different. And the reason they're different is because the apostles uh, wrote from or copied from the Septuagint. And it's very likely that Jesus knew the Septuagint backwards and forwards. Of course, he was, he was divine, so he probably knew a lot of other things too. But uh, it's very likely that he utilized it because it was familiar to, uh, to the folks. And... The Hebrew was really the language of scholars. It was probably the language of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but it was not the language of the common person in Judea during the time of Jesus. And so not to put too fine a point on it, but we can tell that the New Testament citations from the Old Testament are Septuagint because even though the Septuagint was translated from Hebrew into Greek into English, there are certain changes that have been made in our mm -hmm. English Old Testament, and that's why the quotes from the Old Testament in our New Testament right. are a little bit different because of the changes that took place between the time of the Hebrew used for the Septuagint and the Hebrew uh, that was completed by the Masoretes around 900 or 1000 AD. Yeah, the story of the Masoretes, of course, what they did was they took the Bible that had been developed at uh, the well, I'll call it the, 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 the school at Jamnia or Javnia uh, in, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Hebrew language. And, uh, and so uh, they took that, and then the Masoretes about 500, uh, just wrote roughly after the Talmud was completed, they began to uh, meticulously copy it uh, in such a way that nothing would be lost. But the problem was that although their copying was meticulous and wonderful, they were copying what was already a corrupted Old Testament that had uh, a, an Old Testament that misstated the Old Testament prophets that uh, pr predicted the coming of the Messiah. And so uh, it's not in insignificant. And to your point, it isn't until about roughly 890 uh, A.D. and uh, 1008, I believe it is, where you have uh, codices of the Hebrew that are extant, that still exist today. And, uh, and so we know that those are, because of the way that the Masoretes copied them, they're virtually exactly what Rabbi Akiva, uh, what they manufactured at Jamnia. All right, and so uh, that's how that's how we know that there's a difference. Now, the, the Christian Bible, using the Septuagint as well as the New Testament, uh, we have codices that go all the way back to the third century and the fourth century, and so our extant texts are almost 600 to 800 years older than the Jewish text, which basically, in that case, it essentially means that they're more reliable. Hmm. We're going to have to pick this up again next week. We're going to talk about uh, chronology 
and how the chronology yes. in the Septuagint points to Jesus of Nazareth and why the Masoretic text changed the uh, the dates in the Old Testament as our discussion with Doug Woodward, author of Rebooting the Bible, Volumes 1 and 2, continue next week here on Unraveling Revelation. I look forward to it. Th- this is r- remarkable. The main changes in the Masoretic text, according to Doug, just to summarize what he had discussed here, the nature of Messiah was changed so that the uh, Old Testament de-emphasized the fact that the Messiah would literally be the Son of God. Yes. God, he, the, the angel of Yahweh. Yes, the idea that there was an angel of Yahweh, the idea that there was a second power in heaven, mm-hmm. the name Hashem. Right. Which they st- the, the Jews say over and over and over again today. Right. They don't seem to understand. They're actually saying the name of Jesus. Uh, yes. Uh, the mission of Messiah, which uh, was originally about saving the entire world, the Gentiles included. Um, This was not acceptable, especially after the second century when you had so many Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus and Mm. believing in the God of the Bible through Jesus. This was not acceptable to the rabbis, especially after the disastrous Bar Kokhba revolt when the Romans crushed that rebellion and depopulated Judea. as part of that rebellion, Simon Bar Kokhba, leader of the rebellion, really persecuted the followers of yes. Jesus because Rabbi Akiva said, oh, he's the Messiah. And Christians looking at our New Testament scriptures said, um, he's not in the clouds with great glory. He's not the one. We're not going to fight for him. And that led to a split between Jews and Christians that has persisted to this day. Mm, well, that's and, intentional. Uh, and number three, of course, the method of salvation. Keeping the law is emphasized in the Masoretic text, the Septuagint was like, no, no, it's the power of God's name, which again is not his reputation. That is an aspect of the essence of God himself. Yes. So uh, those are the things that were de-emphasized in the translations available to us. But we want to emphasize again, this does not mean that we can't trust our English Bibles. Mm -hmm. As our good friend, the Bible scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser, often says, the best Bible translation is the one that you will read. Yes. The because word of God, most of us don't read it. That is a fact. The word of God does not return void. So choose one that you can understand and read. We have translations that we look to that we like. We like the ESV, the Net Bible, the King James. I like Young's Literal. Young's Literal. We triangulate on the truth. And another tool for getting a better understanding of the prophecies of Messiah's first mm-hmm. and second comings using the Septuagint, and you can find free online translations of the Septuagint because they're in the public domain. It won't cost you a dime to use your internet connection and use that to compare against your Old Testament just to get a sense for what the older Hebrew texts read and what the apostles knew when they were given visions of the end times. When they were given visions that would help to unravel... Ah, yes. Thank you for watching. This is Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at unravelingrevelation.tv and gilberthouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri, 65633.